while we turn our attention to uh, God's Word, join me in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, where we left off last week in verses 31 through 40. John chapter 5, verses 31 through 40, continuing to look at the majesty of Jesus Christ. As you're turning there, the, the scene, the imagery is of a courtroom. The words that you see here, the key words, are the words testify and testimony. Testify and testimony. They're used 11 times in these 10 verses. So the image is that we're entering into into a courtroom scene. All courtroom language. And what Jesus is doing is he's giving evidence to his most staunch adversaries and skeptics. They stand before him. They're the prosecutors. They're saying he is not who he claims to be. He is not the son of God. Now, obviously, this is not a real courtroom, but that's the image. Later on in John, uh, we will see him stand in front of a real courtroom. But there he will not offer evidence or witnesses to defend him. In fact, he will not even defend himself. Then it will be time for him to die, for him to be condemned. Now, though, in John chapter 5, he gives witnesses. He gives evidence. He calls witnesses to take the stand, who will confirm that he is who he's claimed to be. He is God, the Son incarnate. He is God in human flesh. He is equal with God. He shares the Father's divine nature. He shares the Father's eternality. He shares the attributes that make God, God. But he says it in such a way, claiming to be the Son. He's not stealing glory from his Father. No, he is the Son of the Father. So he's been telling the religious leaders this from... Verse 19 through verse 30. Look at verse 19. Verse 19, for whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. He says, as the Son, I share the Father's inherent holiness. He's holy, I'm holy. Look at verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. I share as the Son, I share the Father's inherent omnipotence, the power even to raise the dead. Look at verse 26. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son to have life in himself. As the Son, I share the Father's self-sufficiency. That's why he says, no one can take my life. I'm the one who lays it down. So Jesus' claims cannot be mistaken. He is the eternal Son. He's not a separate God. No, he's the Son of God. He shares the divine nature. He's worthy of worship. Look at verse 23. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. We're equal in worship. How unmistakable were Jesus' words. Verse 18 is so clear. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? Because he was calling God his own father. They hated it. He's calling God his own father. He's saying, I'm the son, which makes himself equal with God. They want to kill him. These are the most hard-hearted skeptics you will find. Put it in today's language. It's as if Jesus is standing before Richard Dawkins. Ever hear of him? Richard Dawkins, right? Author of The God Delusion. Or maybe Sam Harris, who wrote The End of Faith. Or Christopher Hitchens, God is not great. It's the book that he wrote. Those are three of the four so-called horsemen of the new atheism. Bestseller authors. Outright deniers that Jesus is the Son of God. Militant deniers of even God himself. Skeptics of all skeptics. That's who Jesus is standing before. They want him dead. But look at the heart of Christ. Look at verse 24. Amazing. 
Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Right? Come to me. You want me dead. Come to me. I want you to live. If you come to me, you believe me, you believe him who sent me, you'll have eternal life. You won't come into judgment. You'll have passed out of death into life. It's the call of salvation. Look at verse 34. At the very end, I say these things. Why? So that you, the ones who want to kill me, so that you might be saved. Verse 39, you can hear the grief in Jesus' words. You search the scriptures. They're the scriptures that testify of me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. It's the heart of the Savior. He longs for these men to pass out of death into life. He wants them, the desire is for them to be saved, delivered, saved, delivered from their sin, delivered from God's impending wrath. Come to me is the call. So Jesus now gives evidence Evidence. These are skeptics. He knows that. He gives evidence here. Evidence that he is who he claimed to be. Verses 19 through 30, you have Jesus the evangelist. Verses 31 through 40, this is Jesus the apologist. And this is what sets the claims of Jesus and the claims of Christianity apart from every other religion out there. Not all religions are the same. The call of Christianity is not just take our word for it. Never leave somebody with that message. Just take my word for it. That's not the call of Christianity. The call of Christianity is not believe that Jesus is the Son of God despite the evidence against it. No, Christianity does not call for blind faith. The call of Christianity is this. Believe that Jesus is the God, the Son incarnate. And do so with good reason. With good reason. The evidence is there. It's verifiable. It's substantiated. Look at verse 31. Before his skeptics, Jesus says this. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. If I'm the only one saying that I'm the son of God, reject it. Don't follow me. Don't accept that claim. And right here, Jesus sets himself apart, again, from every other religious leader. Jesus' claim to be God in human flesh is not, in any way, is not like what Joseph Smith claimed to have happened to him. He founds Mormonism. Here's his claim that an angel directed him and only him to a book of golden plates that only he has seen. There were no witnesses, no confirmation, no verification, no proof. Believe me, just take my word for it. The incarnation of Christ is not like what happened to Muhammad, the start of Islam. When a revelation comes to Muhammad and him alone, no witnesses there, just take my word for it. The incarnation is like, not like the man in Siberia who's claiming to be the reincarnated Incarnated Jesus. It's happening now. What proof does he offer? Himself. My claims, my words. It's blind faith. Jesus is so different. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. The Old Testament is clear. Truth can be verified. Must be verified by the mouth of two or three witnesses. So this is how he begins by speaking to these skeptics. If there's no one, nothing else that can verify me, then disregard me. But, but, I'm not the only one testifying to this. That's the problem the skeptics have. Look at verse 32. There is another who testifies of me. In fact, Jesus will offer three additional testimonies, three witnesses to his sonship. He's achieving the highest legal condition of the Old Testament. What Jesus does here is great apologetic value. Great. 
apologetic value. Not only does this confirm our faith, which is wonderful, it confirms that Jesus is worthy to be followed, believed, worshipped. But what Jesus says here has great witnessing value, great witnessing value. We need not be afraid to present the evidence of Jesus Christ's identity to the skeptic God has placed within our life. We do not need to be afraid of that. Now, that skeptic may have a higher IQ than us. Fine. That skeptic may be more read in the philosophical literature than us. Fine. But here's the deal. The evidence that Jesus is God's son, all of that evidence is on our side. There's testimony, there's witness. It's verifiable, it's all confirming. So we don't shy away from that. We bring them here to the scriptures, bring them to this passage. And Jesus calls three witnesses to the stand here, three testimonies that confirm he is indeed God, the Son incarnate. We looked at that first witness last week, the greatest prophet who ever lived. The greatest prophet who ever lived, John the Baptist. Look at verse 32. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. Verse 33, who's that witness? You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. It goes back to chapter 1. John says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. That's my testimony, John says. It's eyewitness, an eyewitness testimony. I was there at the baptism. I saw the sky opened. I saw the Spirit descend. I heard the Father say, this is my Son. Look at verse 34. Jesus, referring to the eyewitness testimony, goes on. He says, but the testimony I received from John, though he's a man, it's not from man. It's not just any man. He's a prophet sent by God. Carries with it divine authority. And verse 35, he looks at them and says, Amazingly, you skeptics here, you were willing to rejoice in it. You actually accepted it for a while. You confirmed John's testimony to be true. It's the first witness. Why believe John the Baptist's testimony that Jesus is the Son? John saw it firsthand, heard it, he was sent by God, and the religious leaders actually believed him. So we looked at that last week. Let's move on to the second witness. The second witness that Jesus now calls to the stand. Witness number two, he says, consider the greatest display of miracles ever to be performed. Consider the greatest display of miracles ever to be performed. Not only the greatest prophet, but now the greatest display of miracles. Look at verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. So it's ascending in weightiness. This is weightier testimony, even more convincing testimony than John. Why? Because John's testimony was what one man saw, what one man heard. But this next witness is what many people saw, thousands, tens of thousands of people, what they saw. And Jesus is referring to his own miracle working power, verse 36. The works, the works, here's the greater testimony, the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me. And what do they say? They say this, that the Father has sent me, that I am indeed the Son of God. Now, why do Jesus' miracles identify him as the Messiah's Son? Why? How? Well, it's what the Old Testament promised. Old Testament prophesied. Listen to Isaiah 29, 18. When the Messiah comes, when the Son arrives, what do we look for? How do we know? On that day, the deaf will hear, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. When the Messiah arrives, on that day, there will be miracles. Isaiah 35, 4, say to those with anxious heart, 
take courage, fear not. Now watch this statement. Behold, your God will come. Your God will step foot on this earth. That's incarnation language. And how will you know that God has arrived in human flesh? Here it is. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. And the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. How do you know when the Messiah, when the Son arrives? He's going to confirm his message through miracles. Through miracles. Now look back at John chapter 3. Israel knew this. Look at 3-2. Israel knew this. The religious leaders knew this. Look at verse 2 of John chapter 3. This is Nicodemus. He's the teacher of the land. And he comes to Jesus by night, and what does he say? Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. We know you've been sent. Well, how do we know? Here it is. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know the Old Testament scriptures. We know the promises, the prophecies. Look ahead to John chapter 6 and verse 14. Jesus feeds the 5,000. And notice this, when the people saw the sign, that miracle which Jesus had performed, when they witnessed all of that, they said, this is truly the prophet. That's a messianic title. This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Why would they say that? Because of the Old Testament prophecies, miracles. So understand the function of miracles throughout redemptive history. The reason a miracle was performed was not to amaze the people, primarily. Primarily. The reason a miracle was performed was not to draw a crowd, though it did. It was not even primarily to showcase power. That's not the purpose of the miracles. The purpose of the miracles was to confirm what the miracle worker said was true. Miracles were meant to be authenticating credentials that what the person said was true. That's why Nicodemus says... We know that you're a teacher. We know that what you're saying is true. Why? Because of the works that you perform. This goes all the way back to Exodus 4. Moses, the first miracle worker. Listen to what Yahweh says says to him. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by the tail. I don't know if I'd do that, (laughs) but that's what he says. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Now here's the question. Why is Moses given this miracle working power? Why? Here it is. So that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So that when you go and you say, the Lord has come to me, they will believe that message. Miracles confirm what the miracle worker says. That's the purpose. And that's the reason why Jesus performs miracles when he comes on the scene. It's not, it's not to put on display through his miracles that he is God, though he is. Performing a miracle does not necessarily indicate that the miracle worker is deity, right? And we just read that. Is Moses God? No. In fact, Elijah, we'll look at it in a little bit. Elijah even raised the dead. Is Elijah God? No, he never claimed to be. But Jesus claims to be the son of God, and so he performs miracles to confirm that what he says about himself is true. This is why Jesus did not come primarily as a miracle worker. He came as a teacher. He came as a teacher. His miracles were not primary to his ministry. They're auxiliary. They're confirming works, corroborating evidence that he is God the Son incarnate. Now, let's delve into this just a little bit further. What is it? 
what is it about Jesus' miracles that should cause the most hard-hearted skeptic to repent of their rejection of Jesus as the Son? What is it about his miracles that should leave no doubt that he was who he claimed to be? This is the evidence that he's presenting. And here's the answer. Jesus performed the greatest display of miracle power ever, ever. This is so unique. And the greatness of his miracle power display makes sense given what Jesus claimed about himself. We would expect from someone who claimed to be God's son. We would expect his miracle power to supersede every other miracle worker that went before him, right? We'd expect that. Jesus made claims that no other prophet claimed. Jesus did not come and say, I'm a prophet sent from God. No, he comes and says, I'm the eternal son sent from God. He did not just claim to speak on behalf of God. He says, I, sit, I share the same nature as God. He doesn't come to call Israel to repent and worship God. He says, you need to repent and worship who? Me. If you don't worship me, you don't worship the Father. Audacious claims. No prophet ever made these claims. But it's the greatness of those claims by which then we must or should expect the greatest confirming miracle working power ever to be displayed. It's exactly what Jesus does. He performs miracles as only the Son of God can perform miracles. Let's look at five ways Jesus' miracles were greater than any other prophet before him. Five ways his miracles confirm his claim of divine sonship. Number one, number one, Jesus' miracles were greater in abundance, greater in abundance more than any other prophet. Why well, believe that he is the eternal son? Why well, believe that he's not just a prophet sent by God, but the prophet, the son? Because his miracles were more abundant, unlike anything ever seen. Look at verse 36 again, 536. The works, plural, the works which the Father has given to me, the very works in the plural that I do. Look at them. Look at the works, the many works. So throughout redemptive history, miracles are not common occurrences. Understand that. Miracles are not common throughout the Bible. There are four distinct periods of miracles throughout the Old Testament. Four. It's 6,000 years of history. And there are about 40 miracles in 6,000 years, 40 miracles that were performed by people. That's it. Moses performed 16. Joshua, 3. Elijah, 7. Elisha, 15. Grand total, 41. There are great men who never performed a miracle in the Old Testament. It's really staggering. When you think of the great men of the faith... Right? Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Samuel, David, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Nehemiah. None of them, none of them ever performed one single miracle. Miracles were not common in the Old Testament, 6,000 years. In fact, for the last 750 years before Jesus comes on the scene, from the time of Isaiah to the time of Jesus, no miracle was performed in Israel. None. But now the sun arrives. The sun arrives. What happens? Miracles explode everywhere in Palestine. Throughout Jesus' ministry, there are 36 Specific miracles recorded, 36. That's almost the same amount as the 6,000 years of miracles in the Old Testament. But remember, that's not the only miracles Jesus performed, right? This is what we read in the Gospels, individual miracles. But even back in John chapter 2, uh, we see those in Jerusalem saying, you have performed signs in the plural, signs. Think about Mark 1.32. Mark 1.32, when evening came, 
after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all, all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And you see that repeated throughout the synoptics. Or let's just think of how John puts it at the end of his gospel. There are also many other things which Jesus did. Many things. Well, how many, John? <laughs> so many. If they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Uh, miracles just explode on the scene through the sun. Warfield, B.B. Warfield writes this. When our Lord came down to earth, he drew heaven with him. The signs which accompanied his ministry were but the trailing clouds of glory which he brought from heaven, which was his home. The number of miracles which he wrought may easily be understated or underrated. It has been said that, in effect, he banished disease and death from Palestine for the three years of his ministry. If this is exaggeration, it is pardonable exaggeration. Wherever he went, he brought a blessing, right? One hem but of the garment that he wore could medicine whole countries of their pain. Why? Because he's the son of God, the greatest display of miracles. Why? Because he has the greatest claim, I am God in human flesh. And this is what the people understood. John 7, 31, many in the crowd believed in him, believed what he said about himself. Why? Well, this is what they say. When the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than these, which this man has, will he? They saw the abundance. They saw that it confirmed the greatness of his person. So for all the skeptics out there, Jesus says this, consider the works in the plural, the abundance, which the Father has given me to accomplish. Leads directly into a second way Jesus' miracles confirm his claim of sonship. Not only does Jesus perform the abundance of miracles, but his miracles cover the whole range of existence. The whole range of existence. He does what only the Son can do. The greater in range more than any other prophet. When Christ comes, he's not a one-trick pony, right? Comes to miracles. Every realm of existence, he shows that he has the power over, over it. So he comes on the scene, he possesses power over sickness, fevers, leprosy, paralysis, blindness. He possesses power over nature. He multiplies food. He walks on water. He calms a storm. He transports a boat from the middle of a lake to the shore in a moment. I get seasick. It's awful. On Massachusetts one day, and somebody says, you want to go out on the boat and see whales? I'm like, sure, that sounds like a great idea. Two and a half miles in, I realized, yeah, not a good choice on my end. I prayed, I prayed that the Lord would transport that boat to the shore in a moment. I also prayed for the rapture of the church, and I also prayed that if he didn't do those, he'd take my life. He didn't answer any of those. This is his power, though, over nature. He also possessed power over demons, over the supernatural realm. So not only does he come and deliver someone from one demon, he can cast a whole what? Legion of demons. Thousands of demons in a single word. And then he shows he possesses the power over death. He raises a widow's son, gives life back to Jairus' daughter, and calls Lazarus from the tomb. None. None sent by God before Jesus ever performed miracles that spanned this kind of spectrum. He did things that people never heard of, had never seen, never been recorded. Mark 2. We have never seen anything like this. Or how about this, John 9. Since the beginning of time, go all the way back to Genesis 1. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard, never recorded, that anyone opened the eyes of a person born 
blind. But that's what Jesus does. And please note at this point, Jesus' miracles could not be denied. He performed them in public. There's no smoke and mirrors. They're never prearranged. Each miracle is followed by an instantaneous and visible result, and everyone could see it. Even when you look at his healing miracles, each healing miracle Jesus performed resulted in a full and complete healing. When Jesus heals the paralytic, he gives feelings back to the limbs, but then he restores muscle memory. That paralytic could immediately walk. When Jesus healed the lepers, he not only removed the leprosy, but he restored the skin back to that person. Always full and complete healings. So none could deny them. None could deny them. In fact, even his most skeptical and hateful enemies, they know that he's performing miracles. This is what they say at the very end when they decide to kill him. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we going to do? What are our options here? For this man is performing many signs. He's not fooling anyone. He's actually doing it. So once again, the greatest claim ever to be made that Jesus is God, the Son incarnate, is confirmed in the greatest possible way by a power that spans the whole spectrum of existence. There's a third way Jesus' miracles confirm that he is God the Son. Reason number three. Jesus' miracles were not performed like any other prophet. Jesus' miracles were not performed like any other prophet. There's an abundance. There's a range. But the way Jesus performs his miracles indicates he is unique. He has this unique relationship with the Father. So here's what I mean. Never, never did Jesus call upon God to perform a miracle. Never. It sets Jesus apart from every other miracle worker. Now, in John's gospel, there is one final miracle that seals the sonship of Jesus. It's the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. So turn there just for a moment, John chapter 11. And I want to put two miracles side by side. Elijah raises somebody from the dead, one of those great prophets of old. But what's the difference between Elijah raising a widow's son from the dead and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? What sets that apart? When you're in John chapter 11, stay there. Up on the screen, we're going to see 1 Kings 17. So here's how Elijah's miracle is recorded. He, Elijah, said to her, the widow, give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. Notice the statement, he called to Yahweh, he called to the Lord. And said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times. Here's the key. And Elijah called to the Lord saying this, O Lord, my God, I pray you, I am asking you, let this child's life return to him. There's no mistaking who performed the miracle. Who did it? Elijah, it's God. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. The Lord heard it. And the life of the child returned to him and he revived. No mistaking. Elijah, yes, is the conduit for this miracle, but he doesn't have the power in himself. It came from the Lord. So now let's take a look at Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Start in verse 39. Oh, start in verse 38. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. 
Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Now remember, Jesus purposely, what, stayed away, didn't he? He knew this. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Interesting statement. You'll see God's glory not only in how, but when I perform this miracle. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, now notice the difference here. Jesus offers thanksgiving to his father, not petition, not request. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. This is inter-Trinitarian communication. I thank you that you've heard me. What is, what is this communication always about in Jesus' life? I thank you that you've been directing me to this moment. Thank you that you're directing me to perform this miracle. Through this communication, you have said, stay away for four days, but now you're bringing me to the tomb. I can now perform this for the glory of God. The Father has heard Christ. Is now the time to heal Lazarus? For four days it hasn't been. Is now the time? Do I bring him back from the dead now? Is this miracle and the timing of it all within your will? That just goes back to John chapter 5. The son can do nothing in himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. I need to be directed by you. Always submissive is the son. So as you come to verse 41, Jesus now knows that it's time to raise Lazarus from the dead. Look at verse 42. Jesus says, because of the people standing around, I said it, <laughs> so that they may believe that you, what, sent me. I'm making the statement about this inter-Trinitarian communication so that they will believe that I am the Son. What I'm going to do shows that I am the unique Son of God. He's offering thanksgiving to the Father, not petition, not request. So Jesus proceeds to raise Lazarus from the dead as only the Son of God can, not by praying like Elijah did. This is what we don't see. I pray you, Lord, I pray you, let this man's life return to him. That's not what Jesus says. He speaks a word of command. Verse 43, notice, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He makes the command, not a request. And so understated is always the Bible. Verse 44, the man who died came forth. That's just understated. He speaks to Lazarus. He doesn't speak to the father. Lazarus obeys. Life is given back. They have just seen the glory of God. Now, the people there... What are they going to think back to? They're going to think back to Genesis chapter 1, right? When God speaks, things happen. Look at verse 25, 1125. Jesus said to her, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I, in and of myself, am the one who gives life back to the dead. I'm the resurrection. Chapter 1, verse 4, we were told, in him, in him was life. How much life? So much life he can give it to others. This is exactly, he does hear, he does hear exactly what he told the religious leaders he would do back in chapter 5. Remember what he said, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he wishes. This is why this seals the crucifixion of Jesus. He said he would do it, now he does it, they need to kill him. Never, never did Jesus ever pray for the Father to perform a miracle. Never. That's what the prophets did, not the Son. Never did Jesus invoke his Father's name when he performed a miracle. This is what Jesus' apostles will do later on. They will raise even the dead, but they will say, in the name of who? In the name of Jesus. Now, Jesus performs his miracles as the unique Son of God, speaking a word of command. 
Why? Verse 42, go back to it. So that they may believe that the Father had sent him. They believe that he is the unique son, eternal son. So why believe Jesus' claims of divine sonship? Why? Because he performed his miracles like no other prophet ever, as only the Son of God could. There's two more reasons. I'm just going to give them to you. Do your own research on these deals. There's a fourth, though, through Jesus' miracles that they confirm that he is the Son. The num- number four here, Jesus possessed a miracle-working power that he could bestow on others like no prophet before him. So that is to say, not only could Jesus perform miracles, but now he could delegate that power. It's just amazing. We don't find this anywhere else. Matthew 10, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, and he says this, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then this, heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. That's the power I'm giving to you. Look back at chapter 3 for a moment. Why could he do this? How could he do this? I think we're told in verse 34, chapter 3, verse 34, speaking of the Son, the Son was given the Spirit without measure. And so he can, dispose, uh, uh, he can give the Spirit without measure, bestow it on them. And then number five, number five, Jesus' miracle, miracles were all pictures of his coming kingdom. He's giving a picture of the kingdom that the Son is going to rule over. Jesus' miracles are not haphazard displays of power. Each miracle is specific, it's unique, it's designed to give a picture over which the kingdom will be, of what the kingdom will be. He's going to reign over a coming kingdom that's promised. So Jesus now gives a picture of what that kingdom will be like. It's only what the Son can do. Isaiah 9, remember, a son will be given to us. And here's this, the government will rest on his shoulders. When the Son comes... One day, he's going to establish that kingdom. Well, each miracle shows what that kingdom will be like. You can read this in Isaiah 65. Coming kingdom of the Son, sickness will be removed. That's what he shows, puts on display. Death will be vanquished. Satan will be bound. The ground will produce food in abundance. You see that in the feeding of the 5,000, just a picture of it. Joy will reign throughout the land. All of those descriptions of this coming kingdom. And Jesus says, as the son who will rule over that kingdom, I will give you pictures of it, glimpses into it, as only the son can. One author writes this, in truth, The long-awaited kingdom of Old Testament prophecy had come so near to the men of that generation that they had actually seen the face of the king and also had witnessed the supernatural works, which were the predicted harbingers of his kingdom. We're seeing what the kingdom will be like. It's what the son can do. So far from being a religion asking for its followers to blindly believe its claims, Christianity, like no other religion, says this. Look at the evidence. See that it confirms the claims. Jesus is no mere man. He's no mere prophet. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. He is who he claimed to be, Yahweh in human flesh. Audacious claim, granted, but corroborated by the evidence. And so Jesus' challenge is just simply this. Don't take my word for it. Scrutinize it. Look at the testimony. Look at the witnesses. But let the evidence decide, right? Let the evidence decide. Why do we believe that Jesus is the Son of God in human flesh? Why? Witness number one. 
the greatest prophet to ever live, declared him to be the Son of God. Witness number two, the greatest display of miracles ever performed confirmed that Jesus is the unique Son of God. And then next week, we will see witness number three, the greatest revelation, the greatest revelation ever to be inspired, prophesied that He is the Son of God. Father, You have given us a powerful Word, and You have given us Your Spirit to illuminate that Word to our minds. I pray that when we see the majesty of Christ, we do not stay the same, but that You grow a love for Him in us, a desire to worship Him more, obey Him more, follow Him more. Tell others about him more. Lord, do not keep us the same. Confirm our faith. Ground us through a passage like this, but then give us a boldness, a longing to be that ambassador for Christ who says he is the son, come to him, who longs for people to pass out of death into life. Pray this in Christ's name, amen.